Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Elixir Mix podcast. This week on our panel, we have Josh Adams. That's me. Mark Erickson. Hey, friends. I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv. And this week, we're talking to Chris Keithley. Chris, do you want to say hi? Hey, how's it going? It's going well. It's been a few months. Do you want to just uh, fill everybody in on what you've been working on lately? Yeah, totally. So, um, for work things, I, I'm a senior engineer at Bleacher Report. I uh, mostly work on um, just backend services, lots of like tuning and scaling things. Um, I do a fair amount of like Kafka work, um, which is which is kind of fun. Presents a whole different set of challenges. And uh, in the community, I uh, run in a separate podcast called uh, The Elixir Outlaws with some friends and. Um, I give talks and stuff like that. So I'm kind of always working on like open source or talks or whatever. So, um, but yeah, for the most part, I just spend my time, I don't know, writing a lot of back end Elixir. <laughs> this episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. So I think uh, Bleach Report is like based out of the UK. Is that right? Uh, there is a UK office, but they're actually a, there's a UK office and then a New York office and a San Francisco office. And San Francisco was sort of the original office, actually. Nice which was sort of weird. Apparently, I don't know anything about news or sports, um, <laughs> but this was like apparently a, a weird thing that it was a San Francisco news company is like predominantly news companies are, are in the New York area. Um, and that's, I think that's why we have an office there now. Um, but that's like maybe five or six levels above my pay grade. Um, but yeah, for the most part, we're just like a sports, we're a sports uh, news um, outlet. And so we end up, uh, serving up i think a fair amount of traffic to people turns out sports are sort of like a thing people like um i guess everybody else knew this i was somewhat uh ambivalent to this like i didn't wasn't aware uh but when i got there yeah it turns out they actually like do a fair amount of traffic um and so that presents a whole bunch of diff like different capabilities and uh or different challenges i should say um and we utilize like a lot of the things in elixir to try to combat that and try to like eke more out of all of our uh, puny little AWS boxes to handle these giant spikes. <laughs> how much traffic, how many boxes? So I have to actually uh, check and see like what I'm allowed to say, but let's call it like idling between like five and six orders of magnitude in terms of like requests, like in some cases per second, some cases per minute. Um, I think that's the right amount of zeros. Yeah, that's a, I think that's the right amount of zeros. Uh, and, but we see, the thing is, is we see spikes, uh, the, it turns out like the news cycle is like for sports is really, really spiky. And the things that actually drive traffic are not things that you would expect. Like, it's not like I was, I was on call during the super bowl and like, that was super boring. Just like idled at like more or less what it, a little higher than normal, but the day after Wait, the your workload was super boring or the super bowl was super boring. <laughs> well, apparently the super bowl was also super boring. I didn't watch it. I don't know. I was just watching like traffic and i don't know hanging out with my kids but um the traffic was also super boring so and maybe that's because the super bowl is really boring there might be some causality there i'm not i'm not sure but you know it, it for the most part didn't nothing nothing was that interesting but like the very next day we send out these alerts about like where nba players might be drafted or like where nfl players might go or whatever and those drive like record-breaking spikes um you just immediately so that is interesting i know uh bleacher report is is um especially when i was coming to elixir originally and there was early news about bleacher report and the wonderful success they'd had in moving from a rails back end system to an elixir system that just got a lot of press 
and it got a lot of press in the Elixir community and people were like, wow, that is really cool. They're like getting, you know, like eight times, you know, performance or, you know, being able to scale back number of instances. It's like, what was that? Were you there during that time? And kind of what's it like uh, being in that situation, I guess? Yeah. So I, that's a little bit before my time. Um, I joined a little over a year ago. Um, so a lot of that had happened slightly before me, um, but definitely the the implications of that are still really felt. Um, and the people who've been there for a while had really had like those scars, uh, both from trying to run Ruby at scale and then also from moving to Elixir. But I think some of the apps that we're still running, like some of the services that we're still running, I mean, those were pre, those were Phoenix apps that were like pre 1.0 Phoenix. Um, so there, I think it's probably not inaccurate to say those are probably some of the oldest Phoenix apps out there still. Um, but I think one of the things that I have been able to pick up on is just how like really kind of stupidly easy Elixir makes some of these really hard problems. Like uh, it's very clear that like, these are apps that have grown, that grew from really early days of Elixir um, till now. And they're all current, like they're all running on latest Elixir for the most part. Uh, there's a couple, there's a couple exceptions, but like for the most part, they all get updated. We're running on the latest Phoenix now. And we went through all the transitions, move directories, all that kind of stuff, all the, all the kind of like big changes that happened to Phoenix. Um, and through it all, like the thing that's been super consistent is this ability to continue just like forcing the problems of scale farther down the road. Like, we don't, we spend so much more time just caring about, about our business logic and about what the business does as opposed to like, how do we like throw yet another cash in front of this? Like, is there another Redis we can buy to put in front of this thing and keep it running? And we just don't have to talk about those as much because we're able to rely on this runtime. Funny that you mentioned that the, the biggest thing that I did for performance increase on a site I'm running right now recently was add a cash, but of course not Redis, just to just an elixir cache but still it was way way easier than actually writing the appropriate sequel i'll tell you that yeah i mean and we definitely like still have things in databases and whatever and like we we rely on the same tricks that lots of people have used to scale their apps um it turns out you know that if you go too deep in the tank on some of this elixir stuff you you really limit your ability to start doing massive like horizontal scaling and turns out like horizontal scaling is actually just a really good idea and you should do that uh, for the most part. But you know, when you need to eke out a, some, you know, the, the next tier of performance, Elixir just has these tools ready for you and Erlang. I mean, I guess I should say just has these tools ready for you. You can start pulling in. Um, and that's been, that's been really, really nice. Uh, it's, it's not, I don't think I've ever worked in a runtime where I had this kind of scale and, I could just kind of look at the problem and figure out, Oh, I see the bottleneck's right there. Let's remove that. And then like move it over to here and then like go solve that problem. Um, which has been really nice. So you mentioned horizontal scaling. Um, so how much would you say y'all, so do you run a, a fully meshed, um, application cluster say? So we have a whole host of services. Um, you know, there's probably, uh, I'm going to get the number wrong. We have, we have a very, I mean, it's, it's, it's not much more than 10. Um, but like we have a whole bunch of different services, uh, and those talk to, to each other over, um, HTTP calls at the moment. Um, so we're not relying on distributed Erlang internally, like for, for those service to service kind of communication. And we right. do that honestly, just because, um, it's easier and we don't need to. And, that stuff is like super well known. It's easy to plug into like your existing AWS infrastructure. Like you don't have to worry about um, adding in like uh, SSL or anything like that to your distributed Erlang. If you're worried about it going over like uh, a network, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, so far we haven't necessarily had to rely on distributed Erlang internal to those services. Um, there are certain services at this point where we are uh, moving in that direction because um, bringing state into the client, or sorry, into the service itself, uh, allows us to get even lower latency. Um, and as we're taking on some new challenges, we're starting to work on that, so. I know uh, from reading previous blog articles about Bleacher Report and what they were doing that like World Cup is a, like, was like the, their Super Bowl, right? It's like the big event. 
And is that still the case? Like, cause you, I mean, you just commented on the Super Bowl and how, you know, it's primarily a US based thing and world cup is kind of a everyone else except the US, you know, it's like, it's the world really cares about that. So is that like I you are highest? Up, I'll admit it. You do? Awesome. And I used to sometimes, but yeah, it's like, I don't follow that. And I know people get very passionate about that. So I imagine that is like your highest, like kind of load times and, and, and world cup runs for like, I don't know, some period of time, like a week, you know, I don't know, like what, um, how has, how has it been like, have you been working at the company since going through a World Cup? And what, what kind of, what's that been like from the inside, I guess? Yeah, so um, World Cup is definitely like a high traffic, or high traffic time. Um, that was a big one. Drafts, any kind of drafts are, are, big, are, are big things. Honestly, the things that move traffic uh, are breaking news type things. So where, where people can't necessarily be involved in the game or in like an article at any given point, uh, what ends up happening is we send out push notifications to these apps. Uh, you know, people have the app on their phone. We send out a push notification, they open the app and then they start like retrieving all this traffic. And so we actually have this like stampeding herd problem where I've seen it go, I think I'm allowed to say this. I've seen it go 30 X in, under 60 seconds like just just crazy spikes like like my like you can't auto scale fast enough spikes like there's no way to, to absorb it you just have to you have to, to start degrading things you have to just like coast through it and try to do your best <laughs> like there's nothing else to do um so you know uh i would say it's it's honestly the the spikes for things tend to be around uh larger events but it's always like the thing you least expect. It's like some alert goes out uh, and a lot of us are nerds. So we see the alerts that are, that might be big or whatever. We look at them and we're like, I don't know if that's going to cause anybody to look at the app or not. <laughs> and so uh, all of a sudden we get these huge spikes and whatever. And we try to do everything we can to like preemptively spin up new instances if we think stuff's going to be out there and stuff like that. Um, a really fun anecdote was uh, uh, during the last like NBA draft, um, or free agency or whatever it's called, uh, no one knew where LeBron was going to go. And so because no one knows where LeBron's going to go and no one knows when he's going to announce it, I think we stayed, I think we stayed ramped up like 4X until that happened just because we knew when it happened, it would be this big deal. Mm -hmm. And we just like kept that service like at 4X capacity uh, until the, for, for the duration because there would be no way to work to like, spin up fast enough once the alert went out and you can't delay the alert. Like you have to be the first one to get the alert there or else they're going to, someone their people are going to use a different app. Um, so that it presents all these interesting challenges. So I presume you haven't always worked at companies that work at this scale and you probably haven't always worked with Elixir. So like, what are some of the other, like, where did you come from before Elixir and like, what's your kind of path to Elixir been like? Um, so uh, before Bleacher Report, um, and before sort of like I took professional jobs just doing Elixir all the time, uh, I was a consultant. Um, I worked for myself for a long time, uh, and then I worked at a consultancy called Carbon Five for a long time. Um, way, way, way in the before times, I wrote C for Walmart, uh, and I wrote C on their like point of sales and uh, debit readers. Um, but that was a, that was an eon ago. That's what it feels like. I mean, it wasn't really, it was like 10 years ago, but it feels like a long time. Uh, and then, uh, but yeah, after that, I m mostly kind of jumped around, I did a bunch of Java and then eventually landed in, in consulting and doing consultant, consulting for startups. Um, mostly doing stuff like Java and Ruby, um, JavaScript as you do, because everybody does JavaScript, whether they like it or not. Um, and so I just ended up doing all those sorts of things. And I think I found Elixir... Um, I don't know. It was early. Like, I don't know. Just, I don't even know how many years ago it was. Uh, but yeah, so I found Elixir, um, just cause I was familiar with the Ruby community and all that kind of stuff and really, really fell in love with it. Really liked what was going on. And at the time the community was like really young and really exciting, uh, to be a part of. So I kind of, um, idled around in there for a long time. 
Uh, and then I, I don't remember the year, but at some point I kind of decided like I was going to pursue that as to see if like I could make a career out of like doing Elixir full time. Um, and really went into it and like did a bunch of open source work. Uh, I wrote this tool called Wallaby, which does like browser testing, um, which was, turns out to be poorly named because there's already a JavaScript tool called that. Who knew? I didn't, uh, but whatever. So ended up working on all kinds of stuff and just tried to stay as involved as I could in the community and uh, started giving talks, started doing a lot of research, started learning a ton about functional programming things. Um, pursued a whole bunch of different stuff, but more or less stayed around. And then I guess uh, a couple years ago, a good friend of mine, Lance Halverson, um, who um, he's, he's like fairly well known in the community as well. Uh, he's written like one of the most popular Elixir books, um, which I'm totally blanking on the name of, but it's like learning how to build web apps with OTP in Phoenix. Uh, it's in a great book. Uh, you should check it out. Let's use that uh, functional web development with Elixir. Yes, OTP. There it is. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great book. Um, I'll look to that. Uh, Lance also sort of famously wrote all the guides for Phoenix. Um, so like that was his first foray into that. And then he did other things. So since then, um, anyway, so I met up with him in San Francisco at one point because uh, I was there for a different thing. And he's like, come to lunch with me. And because uh, I was lamenting to him that I really wanted to be doing Elixir. So I went to this lunch at, uh, at Mission Chinese and sat there in eight wings and uh, he pitched me on this idea of coming to work with them at um, this company called the tote. Uh, and I worked full time doing Elixir and I worked there with a bunch of other, like worked there with like Justin Schneck and I'm going to like just name drop tons of people, but it's like, yeah, I worked with Justin and Lance and uh, Sonny Scroggin and a whole bunch of other like people who've been around for a while. Um, and, and then, um, Oh, and uh, Jeff Wise and, and Greg Mefford were there as well. So um, and I'm forgetting people, but, in any case, uh, at some point there was sort of like a diaspora of the Latote Elixir team. Um, I quit about a week before everybody got fired <laughs> <laughs> uh, or let go in some capacity. Um, and so, uh, and then, yeah, I joined, I just kind of reached out to, to my friend, uh, Ben Marks, who has been at Bleacher Report since like their, since, El since Elixir was at Bleacher Report. Um, and he said, you should come work over here. And so that's where I ended up. Um, it's sort of like the path that I've been walking down for a while. I met Josh like forever. How many years, however many years ago? I don't know. I was trying to figure it out, but it's been a long time. It's been a hot minute. I remember I saw you, I think the, the conference we met at, I saw you. Oh, it was in Huntsville. Uh, was, yeah. Talk, you talk about um, just programming. I don't even remember what the talk was. It was awesome. Yeah. I gave a talk uh, about, um, I don't know. It was like a head fake kind of way to talk about like why programming was so fun, but also for me to nerd out and talk about like Turing completeness and like universality and all this kind of stuff, which I just find interesting. So it was like a talk about all that kind of stuff. It was good. I need to, I need to find a venue to give that talk again. That's, that's one of my favorites. Okay. So what's a thing you're doing? Uh, I say in the past 18 months in Elixir that you were not doing three years ago. Um, that I wasn't doing three years ago. Oh man. So many things. Uh, we'll get the obvious out of the way. Um, cause I keep, I bring it up as much as I can, but, uh, I think one of the big things that, um, I'm a big champion of, and I keep talking about, uh, and I'll keep, I'll continue talking about it until it's commonplace across the community is property-based testing. Um, so I, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, I talk a lot about that kind of stuff uh, and I've been doing that for a while. Um, you know, I guess about three years ago, maybe a little bit before, uh, was really when I got deep into distributed systems. Um, and so I've been kind of like continuing to do that, continuing to build that knowledge base, continuing to build, um, tooling around that and, you know, uh, start, start putting those things out into practice, uh, and in production. Um, so those are big things. Those are like the big changes. I mean, I think the biggest change is like now I only write Elixir and I haven't written anything that approximates a UI in like over a year. And that's a very weird place to be. That's a very weird, it changes your frame of reference a lot when you're at least in API call away from a UI. <laughs> I agree. That is interesting. That's, that's kind of where I found myself too. Uh, just kind of like, you know, almost exclusively working with the back end. 
And not because of, you know, I, I enjoy full stack development. I kind of consider myself a full stack developer and yet I haven't really touched the front end for like over a year. Uh, you know, other than personal projects, you know, where I'm dealing with maybe, you know, like right now I'm playing with Flutter and doing mobile development, talking to a graph QL, you know, backed, you know, absinthe Elixir server. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it is, it is kind of weird. And then you've got this library out there for Wallaby for testing front ends. So yeah. are, you <laughs> <laughs> are you still maintaining that? And, and how, what's that, uh, what's that been like? Yeah. So I am still maintaining it. Um, cause I think, cause people use it and they enjoy it. Um, I'm happy that, that that's the case. And I'm happy that I was able to, to help provide something that of value to the community. Um, that makes me feel good. Um, I don't probably give it as much love as I, you know, is it, as it deserves. Uh, and I've sort of put, I wrote a blog post about this, um, where I, I talked a lot about my history with that, um, with that, uh, library and, and everything else. But I sort of put a call out to say like, if anybody else wants to like step in, let me know. And I mean, to, to a lot of people's credit, they did. Um, uh, but you know, I think everybody's kind of looks at it and then they realize like, this is like a lot. We have to deal with browsers and crap. Like, I don't want to do that. Like, that's miserable. <laughs> like, so I think, it, I think that's a, that becomes a problem. Um, and, and it's just hard. It's like the problem domain is hard in the way that building anything for the browser is hard. I mean, it's, right. it's like, that's a real challenge, um, for any number of reasons, you know, uh, just compatibility reasons, uh, just it limitations of the browser limitations of what the browsers give you limitations of all kinds of things. So, you know, we end up, uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's a tall thing to, to ask somebody to come in and like own this, this library that, you know, needs to interact with a bunch of different stuff and do it all consistently. So. Uh, but yeah, but I still maintain in like triage errors and um, there's a bunch of people who have like really stepped up and provided a bunch of like pull requests and stuff like that. And I try to get those turned around as quickly as I can just because, you know, otherwise it, it will stagnate. And I just, I hope that it continues to be useful for people, but I don't probably work on it that much. Are there other people maintaining it or anyone else with commitment or anyone with interest? Yeah, basically my rule of thumb is like if you submit two PRs and I will, and they're great and I merge them, I reach out to you on whatever medium I can find and I'm like, do you want to maintain this crap? And then <laughs> so like a bunch of people, that's basically how I've g gained all the other uh, maintainers and, awesome. and they're all great. Um, everybody's provided, you know, everyone who stepped up and done that has provided a ton of value to that library and, and really helped out a ton. Um, and so um, that's probably what I'll continue to do until somebody, until somebody like, you know, like sticks the landing and is like, I'm going to do this forever now. Uh, at which point they can remove me and it'll be fine. Like it's, it's, it's all good. And it looks like it's just a, a wrapper over phantom JS. Is that correct? Uh, no, I mean, yeah, that was like, that's like a mistake. That was like a, a you know, I mean, talk about like skating where the puck <laughs> went, you know what I mean? Like, it, <clears throat> This was, I mean, to be fair, we, when we made that decision early on, it was like, that was, Phantom was sort of still not, I won't say best in class because I don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to disparage the work of like that Phantom team because they, they did a ton of work on that. And like what they were attempting to do is basically an intractable problem and they somehow found traction doing it. So good on them. Uh, at the time, you know, Phantom was like still the best way to run um, a headless browser. Uh, Phantom had a bunch of limitations that we then worked around because the other big thing is that Wallaby supports concurrent tests. So if you're using Phoenix and you're using Ecto, it'll run everything concurrently. And also side note, and if you're using Postgres because, uh, which you should be, um, because none of the other database drivers, I think support sandbox very well <laughs> last I checked. So, uh, we, we use Phantom for a variety of reasons. And then like, we never, I started working on, I mean, it supports Chrome driver and it supports Selenium and it supports all that stuff. But uh, the outward appearance is that we still support Phantom, which I think is an immediate turnoff for people because they look at it and assume that it's out of date, which I mean, using Phantom is a little bit out of date from what I can tell. Um, so it's something we should go back and, and correct, but I haven't made the, I haven't done that yet, but it like fully supports Chrome driver, like headless Chrome driver and all that kind of stuff. So we should just be using that as the default but time and effort. Actually, one time I needed a, I needed a little feature in Wallaby and I mentioned it to Chris and he helped me add it. Just a little way to interact with the cookie store, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that. 
Yeah, that's super pleasant when there's a library and then it's very easy to get the thing that it doesn't quite have. So Chris, change of topic. I am curious, you've been in the electric community for a long time. You have a podcast, you talk, you present. Like what, what is it exciting for you right now in the electric community and where you think things could be going? It's a really good question. Um, it's a question that like I ask myself a lot <laughs> these days. Like what is the thing that's still exciting to me? And I think the thing that I continue to, to be really compelled by and really excited by is all the things that we get access to when we use these tools. Like it goes back to the scaling thing. Like I've never worked on anything on any other runtime that had this, these sorts of capabilities that could like get you this far, uh, build things that were this fault tolerant, all that stuff. And so the, and that's the thing that got me excited in the first place. Like that was the thing beyond any of the other trappings about like, you know, macros or the, the syntax or these data structures or whatever that was the thing that got me super, super excited about Elixir. And that's the thing that still keeps me in this community. Like, um, I, I don't know, like I don't want to build services or build systems and anything else right now, because this is the thing I, I can make work with like super limited effort. And I'm not going to spend a bunch of nonsense time trying to like solve what should be solved problems. Like, I mean, Erlang is like fascinatingly ahead of its time. And it's sort of only in the last like five years that we're really like, that the world kind of caught up. Um, you know, I mean, I don't think I get as excited as other people about some of the more recent things in Elixir, which is fine. Uh, it's just like not my taste. Like I don't care about, I, you know, I talk about this a lot, but I like famously don't care about formatting. I don't care about like, linting i don't care about any of that junk like and i think part of that is like curmudgeonliness and part of it is just because i don't know like i went through too many iterations of what was considered to be best practice and style in elixir and i've sort of settled on my own and i don't really need anybody to tell me <laughs> what's right or wrong anymore um but yeah, but I don't know. It's like just this runtime in the community and you know, the the leadership and like all that kind of stuff. I think it's like going in a really good direction. It's stuff I'm really, really excited about. Um, I'm really interested in um, seeing where deployment ends up as much as I'm not really involved in that conversation at all. I'm really, really interested to see where deployment ends up because I think that's like a pretty that's like a pretty large sticking point right now. Um, when you compare and contrast Elixir with a lot of the other things that are out there, cause you either have like Ruby or in, in JavaScript, which don't have a package at all. It's just, you know, throw some source up there and then like let it, let it rip um, and throw, throw undefined errors or whatever it is. Like, you know what I mean? Like just throw some source code on a box and run it. Uh, or you have these like, you have these languages that give you increased scalability, but they require building artifacts. So you get like Java Scala um, or, you know, Rust and Go. Like you need to build binaries for these things. And so the deployment story there is like pretty, pretty built in because you like build a binary, you throw it on the box and then you run that. So I think um, when we do like a compare and contrast, um, Elixir has like multi steps to get you there. And that, um, isn't a problem for me and isn't a problem you know, a lot of people who are in this community probably don't feel like it's a problem for them either really because they found ways to work around it but i think from like a marketing perspective it's like a it's a it's a it's a bit of a, a miss and but those things are getting into the language so it's like that's really exciting yeah i have kind of my standard docker file that i gradually change or bring it and modify to make it debian because something dependency something i don't know and uh, like, it's just not, not that big of a deal to me to handle, okay, make a Docker file that makes the, the image, the container that runs the release and put it on Kubernetes. But yeah, I think, I think there is a need for that to be like well-documented how to do it because it's a pain, like going and actually getting your, uh, your cluster connected inside of a Kubernetes system. It's like, it's, it's not super straightforward and it sucks to have to spend a few hours figuring it out. Yeah, for sure. Um, so th those are the things that I, I think are, are interesting. I don't know. I still get excited talking about the stuff that fascinates me, which is, you know, largely distributed system stuff. Um, it's largely property-based testing. 
or, or things that are in that, or things that are in that Venn diagram. Like right now I'm really compelled by a lot of the work that Peter Alvaro is doing. Um, and uh, with, with this technique called lineage driven fault injection, I'm like really fascinated by that. That's a different way to explore the state space of faults that could happen in a system. Uh, in the same way property-based testing, well, I won't say in the same way property-based testing does, but in the way that property-based testing allows you to explore the state space of all possible permutations-ish, uh, because you know, you're still on a bell curve somewhere. Like you're still, you're still just like randomly generating data at the end of the day. Uh, so you may not be exploring as well as you'd like. Um, lineage driven fault injection allows you to sort of like completely explore the state space and like search out those, those, those dark corners where you're going to find edge cases. So I'm like really compelled by that right now. Um, and other research and those sorts of things. Um, those are things that I, I hope to find time to like work on maybe. <laughs> So also, I remember you have you have a library. So one of the things that interests me is sort of release configuration, um, sort of during runtime. Um, and I think you have a I think you made a library about that. Um, I know also there's a, sort of some discussion about it in relation to, I think explicitly distillery, but but releases in general. Um, what a, what do you? I, so I have not kept up with the current state of the art. I don't know if you have. I've just read random things. So um, right now uh, in distillery two, you can provide, uh, or so you, you can use these things called providers to pull configuration into your application. And this is, configuration has historically been like a real pain point um, for deploying Elixir applications with releases. Um, and it's a pain point that again, it's like those of us in the community like dealt with it once, figured out what the problem was and then moved on. But if you're new to the language, it's gonna kind of like break your brain. And it's a lot of, it's a, the part of the problem is like a lot of the early blog posts, medium hot takes, Twitter, whatever, like peep that people said about how to like do configuration in uh, Elixir was to do things like call system.getim inside your config.exs file. And it turns out when you build releases, that doesn't work. Um, this has been like a long talked about thing. So if you've been in the community for a bit, like you've, you definitely probably saw that discussion. Uh, in any case, um, distillery works to remedy this by having this thing called providers and providers, uh, you can, you can, there are a way to pull configuration into your application, uh, prior to it booting. And it does this by creating, um, it does this by like updating your configuration files for when the app like boots the release. So uh, the cool thing about releases is you can start to say thing and you get the full power of Elixir and you can start to say things like, I want to pull this from vault or etcd. Like I don't want to use uh, environment variables because that's like not actually where I store my stuff. I want to use whatever other like uh, store uh, that I have available to me. And that's like super convenient because um, you do often want to do that. You know, the, the, the thing that I'm working on right now, and I think is kind of a bit of a miss right now is that um, right now you don't, there's not necessarily a real consistent way to plug in environment uh, and configuration into a running application. Like once the application is up and running, there's no way to get, uh, there's no conventional way to get config. There's lots of ways that people do it, uh, but there's no like singular way that like provides uh, fault tolerance and provides like these benefits. So uh, one of the libraries I've been working on, um, with, uh, Ben Marks and Jeff Wise is called Vapor and Vapor allows you to specify, uh, overlays of configuration. So you can sort of declare, like, I want to pull this from the environment. I want to pull this from etcd and I'll pull this from vault and I'm going to pull this from a file and you can arbitrarily mix and match those and overlay them however you want. They stack on each other. Um, and at runtime, you can start to actually go fetch all those things. And it turns out like most of what we need to configure is at runtime for like your standard run of the mill, like Phoenix application. Uh, that's, that's like most everything you need to get can be gotten at runtime. There's certain things you can't do. Like if you need to configure lower level OTP libraries, that has to be done preemptively and you should be using distillery for that. And we actually even call that out in the docs. But if you want to configure, you know, your runtime application, uh, you can use Vapor for that. And the other, the other really, really important thing, and this is a thing that I care a lot about uh, for my work and specifically while we're doing this um, to, to use it at Bleacher Report, hopefully, um, you know, once it's done, <laughs> is uh, it allows us to actually watch 
all these configuration sources and to update them dynamically um, when they change. So if we notice that an environment variable changes, we re read that back in. And the reason for that is um, internally, we store everything in ETS, uh, which is uh, Erlang term storage. It's, um, real fast, you get to cheat this, you get to cheat basically, you don't have to go through a process, you can do read concurrency and stuff like that, it's really nice. Um, you get fast lookups, which you're not supposed to be able to do because it's you know an immutable language, uh, all those sorts of things. So we get to cheat all that stuff because it's in ETS. Um, and this is really beneficial for us because it's like I can't be going to an environment variable in the critical path of a request to determine what, I, what it is I need to be doing or like who, what host I need to be going to or, anything right like that's way too expensive like that to, to actually go to the system um i don't have time for that literally <laughs> so uh that's like is a convenient way to get around that um and so vapor provides a mechanism for doing that and also a mechanism for providing fault tolerance around that which is actually the real thing that's like the only reason you really need a library for this in my mind um, because the fault tolerance and the semantics of what you're going to guarantee from a fault tolerance standpoint is actually really complicated um, you, you really have to like be specific about what you're going to choose and say that you're going to do, uh, around this stuff. Um, because there's different semantics based on whether you want to fail something on boot, which is probably the correct thing to do. Like if you're booting your application, the very first thing you want to do is get config. And if you can't, you don't, you want to halt the boot process. Cause like you can't start anything else until you get all this config, but at runtime, like once you're just watching sources, like now, what do you do? Well, now you probably just want to like toss alarms out there and start firing alarms off. Can you give an example of something that you might want to, like a, some kind of environment setting that you would want to pull in during runtime that you might want to be updating and then applying? Yeah, so um, if you're running on like something, if you're running on a, a network that isn't managed by let's say like Kubernetes or some other like, you know, service discovery um, thing. If you need to start doing failover between different hosts, let's say, you know, uh, for some downstream service, like that might come out of an environment. If you want to, you know, one of the things we use it for is fuses. Um, I, this is not the best example because this isn't actually the, the best thing to do, uh, but it's definitely like if you have a nail and you have a hammer, like you can hit the nail with the hammer and it works out. Uh, so, we use circuit breakers in between a lot of our downstream calls. Um, it helps with overload, helps us like fail to caches and stuff like that. Like it just keeps the system running, running correctly when we have this like stampeding herd effect. So one of the things we'll often do is tweak the amount of errors that we can see within a time window and also tweak the time window itself uh, in order to like tune those things. And we do that on the fly based on like environment variables and those sorts of things. So when we see a change, we can like re up, we can update the circuits or whatever we need to do uh, to tweak those values. That's not the smartest way to do it. Like the smart way to do it is to do like equivalent to like how TCP works and do um, additive increase, multiplicative decrease to like tune those values uh, or something smarter like that. Uh, but uh, if, if again, like you just, if you don't have the time to build all that and you need to, you know, build something like this, that's a good way to do it. So that, that would be like an example. Same thing if like, if your database needs to like change hosts, if you need to cut over to a new database, you can do this on the fly now. Um, these are things that probably a lot of people don't necessarily have to do, but I have to do them. And so uh, it's really accommodating that sort of use case. Well, it's super nice when you need it, that it's there. Right, yeah. This episode is brought to you by TripleByte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume. You spend hours and hours on the phone screens and take home projects. And that's assuming the company even responds to your application. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them. And if you do well, you go straight to final interviews with the company on their platform. It's like the common app for software developers. TripleByte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. I've helped dozens of software developers with various credentials get jobs, and this looks like a terrific way for you to get in and get interviewed and get a job without a lot of the hassle and overhead. You can go check them out at triplebyte.com slash elixir. That's triplebyte.com, byte as in eight bits. As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through TripleByte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus.
So you, one of the things you said there that just kind of made me chuckle is like, you know, these are, this is not the things that most people have to do, but I have to do this, right? This is the problem <laughs> you have to deal with. And, and I, think it, I think it's funny, you know, because like when the, you've also talked about Elixir and uh, being able to scale with the, the Erlang Beam and the, the, the VM that we have, uh, like if you were talking to someone else who's kind of, you know, getting started with their Elixir projects and, you know, I, I know uh, like from Ruby and, and Rails and a lot of times there'd be these, uh, this idea of pre, uh, I don't know, uh, optimizing too early, right? Mm -hmm. Like where you're just, you're, you're thinking like, oh, well, if I'm going to be like Twitter and I have to work at this scale, you know, then I, I got to start building my app this way. It's like, well, sorry, but your blog is never really going to be at Twitter scale. Right. So right. like what, what kind of like, I don't know, just thinking about everything you've said about Elixir and like, how, what would you kind of advice you would give to, you know, small to medium sized companies who have Elixir or are, are thinking about bringing Elixir in and they're thinking about like, wow, you know, we might really have to worry about scale. You know, what, what kind of advice would you give them? Um, one of the things that I continue to find really striking and I get, you know, obviously this is, uh, with a whole handful of salt because I've been doing this for a hot minute now. Um, but I think it's, I think it's accurate for, from new people as well as like, you don't take like a huge productivity hit coming to Elixir. Like you can just get in there and there's good libraries to like, you know, spin stuff out and try things and start building. And you really only have to learn like, a handful of constructs, really the syntax and pattern matching in order to build something new. And, you know, I often advise people, this is, you know, heresy these days, right? But I often advise people like, especially coming from Ruby or Rails, that tends to be, you know, most of the boats coming over are from like the like Ruby and Rails. Uh, and I tell people getting off those boats, like just build your, build your Rails app. Like take Phoenix and build a Rails app and it's fine. And you're going to like, just go down that path. Like you don't need to like go hard into OTP. You don't need to only use plug and build it up from first principles. Like just build a, build a rails app, but use it in, but do it in Phoenix. And that's going to teach you a whole bunch of stuff. And you're going to end up with a product that like works and you'll be able to fix it later on. Like, uh, you know, one of the things that continues to strike me is how, I don't know. I don't know if this is a Bleacher Report thing or I don't know if it's an Elixir thing or some combination of, but all the Elixir apps I've been working in, I mean, maybe this is just like blessed company. I don't know. Uh, I don't think I'm some grand wizard of, of programming, but like most of the Elixir apps I've worked on tend to be really easy to move around in. It's just modules and functions. You just like take a module and you call a function with some data and like stuff just works. And so you don't pay the price of all this coupling that you get in a lot of other languages. Um, and so, you know, I think if you start off and you just build like a Phoenix app, like you're going to be in such a good place at this point, like what library are you truly missing that, that, you know, and that really, really made a difference for you. And some people get, some people really love their gyms, I guess. And there's a lot of them, but I don't know, like that's a really good place to be. And when you're done with that, you're going to have learned a little bit and then you're going to have OTP there. And so now when you want to make this thing really, really fault tolerant, um, which is actually arguably more important than scaling right? That's actually the key of scaling is fault tolerance, right? It's not actually being able to like, people talk a lot about, you know, oh, well, Java's faster for CPU. And it's like, yeah, but it doesn't matter. Like who cares? Like, because the point isn't that it's faster raw computationally. The point is that it's more fault tolerant and at scale, all, everything is false. Like, you know, all you get is faults. So really all you're handling at that point is faults. Your CPU didn't buy you anything. Uh, unless you're running some of those stupid tech and power benchmarks. So like, that's my benefit. And that's, that's my sales pitch is like, you don't have to relearn the way you don't have to change a huge amount of what you do. You have to learn pattern matching, which is going to be awesome. And you're, once you learn it, you're not going to want anything else. You're going to learn immutable data. And again, once you have it, you're never going to want anything else because the fun thing about immutable data is that it changes everything. Uh, and you know, at the end of the day, like you're just going to be in, this such a better place uh, going forward. Like, 
I would pitch this to San Francisco companies because at the end of the day, like San Francisco uh, still to this day is like the, you know, they, they don't get money anymore for startups. Like they're very, very little, like limited amounts of money. And so everybody just like windmill slams rails because that's like, it's a commodity. It's a commodity at this point. Like literally rails development is commoditized. It's super cheap. You can pay anybody to build a rails app and go for it. And at the end of the day, you'll rewrite it if you ever achieve success. And that's, that's fine. Like that's a way to build a business. Um, I'm, I'm not knocking that, but you know, my sales pitch is like, what if you just didn't do that part? What if you didn't do the part where you rewrote anything and you just built it in this language that you didn't have to do that. And that to me is like really what's exciting about it and why it's useful even at like low, low scales. Yeah. I will say, I definitely don't feel anything like a um, productivity hit in Elixir. I feel, I feel the opposite, but I'm sure when I started, there was some kind of hit. Yeah. It's hard to look back on those years now. Right. It's like hard to look back however many it was like it's, it's how many years has it been like five, six years? I don't even know. Like four or five years, I don't, whatever. It's hard to look back on that and be like, well, obviously, I mean, I was more productive than too. Like, you know, that's like an unknowable thing. And also productivity is like a bad metric. It's like a marketing metric. It doesn't mean anything because it's an unknowable thing. It's like paying for somebody to go to, you know, management training. You don't know if it worked or not. Like, <laughs> I, I know that I am happier and I build better things now than I did then. And maybe that would have been true also. You hold the elixir in your hand. And you're like, does this bring me joy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will add to this because I'm, I, I'm still playing with elixir. Um, I mean, I spend most of my time doing podcast management stuff, right? So most of my development stuff is in rails and yeah, there are some things that I've kind of had to feel my way, way around, but yeah, what you, you saying basically build a rails app in Phoenix. I mean, that, that's more or less what I did, right? I would, I just bolted the handful of things in that made the code run mm -hmm. as I went. And yeah, I mean, it wasn't too far off the mark for me. And at the same time, um, I've talked to a number of people who, you know, they, they may even like Rails and Ruby better than Phoenix and Elixir, but there's some trade-off for them that makes it wildly pay off to be in Elixir. And so, you know, it could be performance. That's usually what it is, is the, the parallelism and then just, you know, something else in, in uh, Elixir, the Beam or OTP or any of these other things that kind of, you know, allow them to connect to something that just really makes it process quickly whatever requests are coming in mm -hmm. that they can't get away from and so it, it's interesting to talk to people and see where they're at and it's like yeah you know if it's a generic app i go with rails and if it's a performance app then i go with elixir mm -hmm. and yeah then also seeing that there are a lot of familiar faces and you know the methods of doing things and things like that in elixir i find a lot of people either move back and forth easily or have come all the way over and just do things in Elixir because the payoffs make it worth it one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, I think there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of things that you get head faked into learning. Um, I mean, it's also, you know, again, like a lot of people, a lot of like diehards will, you know, consider it heresy that I'm saying, like, I think building a Phoenix app and calling it a Phoenix app is fine. Uh, you know, people get uppity about that stuff, but I don't know. It's a good way in. And then you're going to head fake learn about all these other really good things like immutable data, like just immutable data, like having immutable data built into the language is, is an eye opening experience. And you, once you have it as a first class thing in the language, which is really important, like that's the key. If it's in the language and the language supports it, um, you're going to just be better off. You're never going to want to go back to a time where you didn't have that. And you can sort of trivially refactor, uh, you know, the just a Phoenix app style app into something with uh, more concrete boundaries later on. And since it's all just functions, it'll work and there's nothing confusing. Well, the other yeah. thing is, is you also have a starting point. One thing that I found, you know, coming up in Rails and then coming, you know, and playing with Phoenix again is that I've been able to sit down with other people and have them look at my code and say, yeah, this will work, but it's not sort of the elixir phoenix way but then i get to have the conversation with them about why do we do it that way then mm -hmm. and then learn all these other cool things about the language yeah well the good news is that right now is still i mean for me it doesn't feel this way anymore and i don't know josh you might feel the same way like but 
these are still really early days. Like stuff is still being formulated. And when I, I really cringe and balk whenever anybody says the anything way, because as far as I'm concerned, like those things are not solidified, like, like patterns. I mean, there are only a handful of patterns that I truly kind of think are bad and they really all stem around performance. Um, you know, like the one thing that I like, I'll just say is like the overuse of gin servers and stuff like that. Um, they cause arbitrary bottlenecks in your system. Like you don't actually want to do that, et cetera. Other than that, like, man, people are still figuring it out. They're still figuring out what the right way to, 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 to design and build um, and organize these, these systems are, you know, like whether it's umbrellas or whether it's whatever the poncho thing. Um, I was there by the way, when that, term got coined and I cringed then and I cringe now <laughs> so <laughs> like yeah. it, like but like that or like Dave's got his whole component thing which is bonkers to me but like you know go for it like explore you know, it right you Alon Z you like you know go forth and like build your thing like that's cool like and he's trying stuff I don't know like be weird yeah exactly yeah keep keep elixir weird um you know, I, people are really, I think there's a desire to find like the, the sort of zeitgeist or like the thing that we all agree with. Cause I, programmers just generally love homogeneity. Like we love to do the same things, which I think is a really bad idea just, you know, economically, cause like the mix is replaceable, but whatever. Uh, but in any case, setting aside that, I don't know that those things exist yet. So anybody who says like, oh, well you should put these things in these directories or whatever like you can largely ignore that anyway because it doesn't matter <laughs> yeah I, I started to get turned off by the uh the omakase ruby slide well rails uh thing um and i would hate to like you could still use rails without all these pieces but honestly like there's this ossification that means that most rails apps look like that and i would i would hate it if most phoenix apps look the same long term really yeah for for sure and and definitely like it's always good to get you know ex experienced people to look over your stuff and say like oh you might have a problem here you know like oh you're using a lot of timers this can cause problems in scheduler whatever like you know there's there's, there's those sorts of things and th those are all great um but i don't know like i hope my my hope is that we continue to try to push what people uh think is normal and what people you know what people are bringing to the table it's one of the reasons i talked for forever about property-based testing and lately i've sort of like taken uh take like i feel like the community like picked up on it like like people got excited about it and so it was like oh sweet like i can move on to the next endeavor now um and find the next thing to like go champion like not to, not to like sorry that comes across like i i single-handedly like you know taught the community this this technique which is not true uh, but you know i the, well, I, still, the, I still want you out there taste making though <laughs> well, but like, but you know, I mean, the community picked up on it. Like the community is excited about property-based testing and regardless of the libraries that they're using or whatever, it's like, you know, they're, they're really excited about it or at least like interested in it. And that's awesome. Like that's a, you know, that's moving the community forward in a way that is different than other, I mean, any other programming language that I've worked in in a while, like no other language or runtime I've been in has cared at all about something like generative testing. And, and here we are with like some of the literally, I mean, it, it is not overstating it to say some of the best tools for generative testing in the industry across any language. And they're just in our backyard, like ready for us to use. So we ought to be taking advantage of that. I also think it's interesting. The Elm community is pretty big on generative testing as well. And I, mm -hmm. I think that's a nice little, uh, maybe that's an indicator I could use to, to find other things I find interesting because Elixir and Elm are right on up there. So I'm curious, Chris, um, are there any things that you have started to kind of already be thinking about? Like, yeah, I, I'm interested in kind of bringing light and more awareness to this issue or this, uh, this thought or anything like that. Is there anything that you're already kind of heading in a direction? Um, so I think there's two things. Um, one is I really want to, um, I really want to help uh kind of with distributed system stuff um and like the the education around distributed systems for the electric community um because i think the the resources that are out there are still they're largely locked up in people's heads 
not because not for any fault of anybody or you know but it's like a lot of that knowledge is built around expertise and built around doing it and so a lot of like the hard one experience the stuff that really helps you build these things in production is really locked up in people's heads right now um and and or it's like in weird offshoots of the community and so uh, I'm working to figure out better ways to provide um, knowledge around around that stuff and around the tools that we get around the limitations or lack of limitations um, that we get. You know, um, I really want to push back on this whole like, oh, well, Elixir doesn't work on Kubernetes idea, you know, like or whatever, you know, Kubernetes solves X problem that we have. Why, why do I need Elixir for that? Etc. Like distributed systems don't work on, or distributed Erlang doesn't work in Kubernetes. Like that's not a true thing. So, yeah, I want to push back on on some of those and help provide guidance around that stuff. Um, and so, to that end, like I'm actually doing a training at um, Lone Star Elixir and uh, Elixir Conf EU around this stuff um, around around distributed systems. So, hopefully, that'll be that'll kind of help provide um, a baseline so I can keep working on that stuff. And there might be more things in the future. Um, so that's, that's one thing for sure. Uh, and I want to, and I also as part of that want to show off a couple of these new techniques, like specifically all of Peter Alvaro stuff with LDFI, um, lineage driven fault injection, because I think it's brilliant. And I think it's absolutely, um, well, I think it's, it's a worth pursuing. It's it, the promise is there. Um, the other big thing that I really want to pursue personally, uh, and I've been toying with these ideas uh, along with just like some of my random projects that I need to build for work, um, namely a, a different HTTP library um, based on XHTTP, which if anyone wants to talk about that, hit me up. Uh, besides that, the big things that I really wanna pursue uh, and kind of champion in the community next are, um, uh, based around these, this idea of contract systems. Um, and this is in sort of contrast to type systems. Um, I have gone in and out of like the type system thing. I did Haskell for a really long time. Like I get it. I get why people like it. Um, but for me and for the types of things that I end up working on, uh, types don't buy me enough. Like they don't really buy me almost anything for the kinds of things that I need to do. Other, like they solve like trivial problems and they don't solve any of the stuff that I need to solve like on a daily basis. Uh, not cause like I'm a genius programmer, but just it turns out that most of my problems are at a higher level of abstraction than, you know, is this a string or is it an integer or whatever? And like, we'll set aside dependent types for just a second and session types for just a second. Um, because you know, those are, those are still research projects. Uh, and so I'm really compelled by this idea of like contract systems and about doing more things at runtime and taking bigger advantage of the language itself, the runtime that we have. And so um, we've actually started, uh, I haven't released it yet. I'm hoping to be able to release it. I am giving a talk on it um, uh, at some point this year. Uh, but we actually internally, um, for all the Kafka stuff that we do, we actually built our own serialization um, and contract system to go around the data uh, processing that we do. And so all the data that we pump through Kafka gets tagged with these contracts. Um, and they're in the, the benefit of that is that we can actually say like interesting things about the data. Like we can actually start to say more interesting stuff than this is a string. We can actually start to say like, this is a string and it's an email. And if it's not an email, it's a number that's greater than 32. Like, but only if this other key is this, like we can start to like build those sort of interesting predicates, which are like much more compelling. And the next level of that is to be able to do that across functions. So you can actually say like, the precondition for this function is that all these in integers must be, I need, I'm going to take a list of integers and they all need to be less than 255. And the output is going to be a string that starts with a hash because I'm building an RGB to hex converter. And like, that's where you can actually start to get real power. And then you, you know, tie that back into the property based testing thing. And then you get something that's really, really arbitrarily powerful. Um, so I, I'm very interested in sort of trying to push people away from thinking about types in Elixir, because I, one, don't think that's a winning solution. I just don't think that's like a good long-term solution given the runtime that we're on. And I don't think they're powerful enough. Like I don't think they're useful enough for the kinds of work that we want to be doing in, in Erlang and Elixir. 
Uh, so I'm really interested to try to maybe pursue this idea and like push that agenda a little bit. Well, that sounds very interesting. I look forward to seeing kind of where you go with that. Yeah, it's nascent at the moment, but I mean, it's, and, we're, and I'm standing slash stepping on the face of a bunch of giants, like who have also gone before me and all this kind of stuff. But like, that's, that's the stuff that really motivates me because, you know, um, like at the end of the day, like, I don't care if, if it's an integer or a string. What I care about is these two pieces of data commute. Like I care that commutivity is a thing. And when you have a type system that can tell me if two things are commutative, like I'll sign up for that type system, but we're a long way from away from that type system, even with dependent types. So, uh, you know, I, I'm much more interested in, in different ways of thinking about that problem. Very cool. Well, anything else that you want to bring up before we go to picks? Um, yeah, uh, no, I mean, I can do, should I like, I guess I could plug myself a little bit and cut, cut this out. <laughs> but yeah, like, absolutely. Go uh, ahead, plug yourself. Uh, ahead, no, plug, I mean, so, plug your competitor podcast that we <laughs> all love to hate or hate to love or something. Yeah. Like yeah. Well, you can edit this out if it's, if it becomes, you know, controversial, if you, you know, need to like, no, it's all good. <laughs> so yeah. So, uh, I, I do a, um, a weekly podcast, um, with some friends of mine, uh, Amos and Anna, um, we just kind of struck and jive and talk about stuff, talk about Elixir, talk about things we're dealing with. Um, talk about stuff going on in the community. Uh, and that's at elixiroutlaws.com if you're interested in that. And then, yeah, like I said, I'll be giving a training. I'll be doing some training and speaking this year. Um, we're doing the distributed systems training with uh, Ben Marks, also from Bleacher Report uh, at Lone Star Elixir and Elixir Confi U. So if that's interesting, um, check it out, see, um, come on by and um, hopefully start um, helping out with that a little bit. Very cool. All right. Well, let's get to the picks. We'll put links to all that stuff in the show notes, by the way, folks. Um, Josh, you have some picks for us? I have two picks. My first pick is the axe. I believe the axe is a fantastic tool and you should use it. <laughs> you mean the thinking. physical like wood cutting axe, right? I do mean the physical wood cutting axe. I bought one Saturday and cut down a tree and it felt great. <laughs> oh, I, I, thought, I thought you were going to say that, uh, you know, you used it right before you roasted a goat. No, no. I thought you were going to talk about the adolescent body spray. <laughs> no, I'm, no. I'm talking about I, I bought an axe and ground it on my bench grinder and then cut down a living thing with it. Um, <laughs> that was fun. Uh, then I also, feel inadequate now. <laughs> that's the goal. But seriously, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and then the other is shameless self-promotion. Uh, we just launched a course on GraphQL that has an Elixir and a JavaScript or TypeScript backend that we write. And then uh, front ends in each of Elm, React Native, Flutter, and Vue. And uh, it's a lot of fun. And we just launched that at smoothterminal.com. So I would be honored if you would look at it. Awesome. Mark, what are your picks? So this is a simple one. It's, uh, one of, it's a command line tool, uh, or actually command that's built into Bash. It was shared with me. I had a good opportunity to work with David Richards. He's on Ruby Rogues. And he shared this with me when I was just working with him. And he's like, I, just, I see him do this. I'm like, what are you doing? That's like magic. And he, he's like, yeah, I'm surprised how many people don't know this. And so basically what it is, is it's a CD space hyphen. And the CD, the CD hyphen just says, I want to change directory to the last directory I was in. So like if you're moving around the command line a lot, like, you know, doing git or tests or whatever and you'd say you know i'm jumping between two different projects or two different folders if you go from one into the other then you can just cd you know back to or, or cd hyphen and jump back to the one you're previously in and if you do cd hyphen again you'll just jump back to where you were again so like just goes between two last directories i use it all the time i'm super impressed with it and uh so yeah i just People should be playing with fun things like this and sharing them with people you know, because that's how I learned it, is that someone shared it with me. Sorry, my mouse disappeared and I couldn't unmute, <clears throat> which might not be a bad thing. Um, I'm going to quickly throw out a pick. Um, so I have been playing with um, a few things. One of them is Zapier. I've, I think I've picked this on every other show, but I do a lot of automation stuff in Zapier um, for the shows. And... Um, really really enjoy that and then um, another thing that I'm going to pick and I did pick this on Ruby Rogues so if you um, anyway uh, so I picked up the uh, a camera and uh, the reason is is because um, recording videos on my phone just doesn't feel 
professional, I guess. Uh, sometimes they turn out good and sometimes they turn out not as good. And so I wanted something that was a little bit more consistent. So um, when I was in uh, Las Vegas for CES, um, I picked up a Canon M6 camera. Um, now, the one that I bought came with a 15 to 45 millimeter lens, which means that it, you know, for, for somewhat close up uh, stuff, it, it looks pretty good. In other words, if I put it uh, a few feet away and then record a video on it, it looks nice. Um, if I'm recording like a, a demo at CES, it looks nice. And then I got a Rode microphone that goes on top of it. It's just a shotgun mic. Um, they usually run about 50 bucks, um, but it mounts to the, like the flash mount on your camera. So uh, anyway, I've been pretty happy with that too. I kind of want to get a light that goes on it so that, you know, I can mount the light and then the, um, the microphone. But yeah, I've been pretty happy with it. Um, I'm not sure if it's a DSLR or not. Um, it's mirrorless. It looks like just a regular, you know, point and shoot camera um, with a lens on the front. But uh, this particular model is really good for video. And, uh, you know, there are some trade-offs for still phot photography with it. But it still takes decent still photos as well. So I've been pretty happy with it. And like I said, it's a Canon EOS M6. So uh, I'll put links to those in the show notes. And uh, yeah, hopefully you can uh, see what I'm doing with it. If you go to YouTube, devchat.tv slash YouTube. Um, Chris, what are your picks? Uh, cool. So uh, I recently, at uh, the suggestion of another Elixir friend, Paul, uh, bought a mocha pot to make coffee in. This is, I'd heard about these and been aware of it, just being like a coffee person. Uh, but I picked one up um, and it's great. It's really, really fantastic. Uh, I've really been enjoying uh, using it. Um, so that's been nice. Um, recently, in order to sort of like unwind uh, occasionally, I've been playing this new game. I think that, I mean, it's not new to me. It's probably like most people have probably heard of this, uh, but I've been playing this game called uh, Pacross on my uh, Switch. And it's super fun. Also, it's like a life lesson in the dangers of mutable state uh, when you get into it. Um, but it's really, it's like Sudoku, but kind of harder uh, and more interesting. Uh, it's really, really interesting. Um, took a, takes a second to learn it, but once you figure it out, it's really fun to go through those puzzles. So it's like, it's like $8 on uh, the Switch or whatever. Um, and then uh, one other thing that I'll throw out there uh, that I've been enjoying a lot as I've been getting back in, I guess like sub uh, sub pick is RSS still rocks and I don't know why we ever stopped using it and you should go back to it and quit all your other social media. Uh, it's a good way to live life. Uh, but as part of that, I've been reading um, Hillel Wayne's uh, blog like constantly. Uh, his posts are really, really, really good. He recently wrote a book on TLA plus if you're into like formal methods and stuff. And um, he's one of the few people who you know, he, he straddles this line between like clearly super, super knowledgeable, super deep, super aware of a lot of like pretty complicated uh, CS stuff, math stuff. Um, but he's got this nice way about his writing where he doesn't really like take sides in it. He doesn't make you feel bad about not knowing these things. He's just really passionately excited about formal methods and about math and about, um, kind of solving these different problems and, and figuring out how to incorporate like testing, formal methods, agile, all that stuff together without judgment. And um, yeah, his blogs are just really, really good and totally worth reading. I've been just like reading through all of those. So uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll post one of his like sort of one of my more choice uh, blog posts, which I think is really good. Um, and that hopefully it'll get people excited about that because I think he's a really good writer. So uh, worth checking out. Yeah, we had Hillel Wayne on uh, JavaScript Jabber. We were talking about the recent, um, oh, what was the package? Anyway, there was a package that event was... Stream. Event Stream. Event <laughs> Stream, yeah. We had a long talk about Event Stream, so... He wrote the best take on Event Stream ever. Like, I mean, he wrote, like, the blog post, it's really long. But he basically does this super analysis of Event Stream and why, and all the things that had to go wrong. And it's to make that happen. And, it, and it's really, really in depth again, without judgment and just sort of like, 
he calls out his biases. It's really good. Super, super good. Yeah, we, we might have uh, pointed fingers without pointing fingers on the JavaScript. <laughs> that, that'll be out a few weeks after this one will be. So um, anyway, if you're interested in that and interested in what he's been writing up, it, it was really, really interesting. It was funny too because he's not a JavaScript expert per se, but it was a security analysis. And yeah, just looking at all the stuff. And it was also interesting to have everybody kind of go, well, what if we all did this and then have him go, yeah, but <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> right? And then break it down. So, yeah. anyway. um, well, thanks for coming, Chris. This has been a lot of fun. Cool. Thanks for having me. All right, folks, we'll wrap this one up and we will be back next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.